Good morning, everyone. I am Diana Snowden Sess, and it is my great honor to welcome you all to this really important climate talk today on the subject of bottle reuse. Um, Porto Protocol has, has been part of my life for the last two years. I've been a member for the last two years. It is a group of wine professionals who share best practices and tips and resources from all over the world in their, in their companies. And it has given me a great head start in getting my businesses more sustainable and has been such a useful, free, easy resource available at all times. And um, traditionally, the subjects that we've been tackling have been sort of the easy subjects, what we call low hanging fruit. Today is everything but that. Um, if we're going to stick with metaphors, we're reaching for the stars. But of course, um, it's a big ticket item because when, if you've got done any work in terms of carbon accounting and looking into how to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions, you will know that our wine bottle accounts for anywhere from 50% to 70% of the carbon emissions for a, for a winery. And so it's really a huge issue. It takes so much heat to melt glass and make a bottle. And if this bottle is only single, single use and goes straight into the bin and of course recycling is another quagmire and every country has different success in recycling glass but even if it does get recycled it's still a tremendous amount of heat to reheat uh, the glass and melt a new bottle and for generations we reused glass and it's only in the last 30 years that we decided that that was um, that was not necessary and that we would throw the glass bottle away and, um, and as we realize that it is time to get to zero emissions and to, to make our companies um, zero, zero emissions and in agreement with the Paris Agreement, the bottle is going to have to be, the way we bottle our wines and re, re, reuse glass is going to have to be reconsidered. So it is so exciting that um, there are more and more companies, countries, and, um, and co-ops that are starting to use bottles over again. It is not just a fringe thing at this stage, it's really gaining momentum. And today we have four companies who will tell us their story, how long they have been using bottles, um, the logistics that are involved, the particularities of each country. We have four different countries represented today, and they're each going to tell us a little bit about their landscape so that we can devise our own strategy for where our, our wineries and our, our, um, and our communities are located because it's very geographically dependent and, and quite a complicated story. So we have 60 minutes to, to figure it all out. I've been so lucky to actually have met um, in person almost everybody. Almost everyone ha was able to come to Domaine Dujac and share a glass of wine and speak about sustainability. And that's the other wonderful thing about Porto Protocol is that you meet people who are on the same very difficult uphill battle and who share the same love for wine and it gives you so much strength and courage to be optimistic and so i am so pleased to introduce these four people and have them in my in my professional career and i and welcome all of you to please enroll in porto protocol join our big party share what you have learned um, it starts with sharing a case study and um, they get categorized by subject on the Porta Protocol website. And then they're just a really useful tool if you decide that it's time for you to plant trees or it's time for you to reuse bottles or it's time for you to capture carbon dioxide from your fermentations. You'll have all of these firsthand experiences at, at the ready. So with no further ado, I'm going to pass this off to our four guests today. Um, Melissa Saunders, Master of Wine. She has um, both an import company called Camille Brands and she is the Managing Director of Good Goods in, located in the United States. Then Muriel Chantal is, has uh, sustainable wines in the UK and then Bernard Graffé is a family, uh, running a family négociant in, um, in Belgium. 
And finally, Lise Roland from France uh, is representing OA. So I'm going to mute my mic. Uh, we're going to let them tell the story and we'll, I will field questions at the end, but first we need to kind of paint the picture and tell us kind of the basics. And uh, once that is, once that is, we've gotten through that information, then I, I welcome you to put questions into the chat and I will, and I will pass them along to, to our guests. So Melissa, I hand it over to you. I'm going to mute my mic. Thank you all for being here. And uh, let's hear about bottle reuse with good goods, please. Thank you so much, Diana. And thank you, Christina and Marta for having me here today. Um, it's definitely an honor to be a part of this organization. Um, so as Diana pointed out, um, I um, am the CEO of Communal Brands, which is an importer distributor of wine based in New York City. Um, I started the company in 2009 and have always had a focus on sustainability uh, with my portfolio. And um, I like to refer to the type of sustainability that I'm focused on as being more holistic um, from the farming all the way to the packaging. Um, I noted very early on, well, early on relative to, I guess, um, where we are today that the packaging, as Diana pointed out, does have a tremendous impact, uh, the greatest impact of um, any segment in the life cycle of, uh, of a bottle of wine. And so in um, 2016, I embarked on um, starting to produce a number of wines in bag and box, um, premium wine though, um, in the bag and box format, noting that it actually has the lowest carbon footprint of any of the um, at least single use uh, packaging for wine. So for me, that uh, particular journey started in 2016. And um, then more recently with Good Goods in 2021 with the reusable bottle. Um, what got me on to bottle reuse, um, in addition to bag and box and the importance of it, um, was really um, through my the research paper that I wrote for, for the Master of Wine program, um, which focused on the environmental impact of packaging for wine. And through my research, which commenced, you know, really on a heavy level in about 2018, um, my knowledge of the negative impact of, of, of single use glass really deepened. And that's where my, um, uh, uh, I guess, knowledge of the subject and of the problem uh, really elevated my motivation to effectuate change. Um, with respect to good goods, um, so 2021, um, I'm the director of wine. Um, I'm tasked with uh, curating uh, uh, wines that are in reusable bottle. But um, I also have um, a legal background and a background in um, import distribution. So I, I try to help on all levels. And uh, we, we realized uh, quite early on that this is uh, a big journey that we're on. This is not something where we're gonna snap, snap our fingers and be in reusables, but little by little, um, we're getting there. Um, we will be, uh, we haven't actually uh, launched um, a wine bottle in uh, a, a wine in a reusable bottle yet, but that is happening um, this spring. Um, why did it take so long? Um, because it actually takes uh, more time and effort, I think, than uh, at least we realized early on to to uh, procure a significant number of bottles to achieve the scale necessary to wash and reuse. Um, so you know, after at least for me, about, about a year um, where we are there, um, where we actually have, have the scale to be able to um, wash and reuse. And we will be launching our first wine in a reusable bottle later this spring, which is really exciting. Um, but you know, procuring those returns and getting consumer mindset around the idea of returning versus just put, putting it in the recycling bin um, was, was somewhat of an unanticipated hurdle. Um, yeah, so I guess um, speaking a little bit about that hurdle, I think um, generally speaking, you know, education is an important piece to this puzzle. Uh, the majority of the people that I engage with on this topic, their first instinct is, well, glass is, is fine because it's recyclable. That's most people's knee jerk reaction. Um, but the sad reality, at least in the US, is that um, you know funding for recycling programs is being cut on a regular basis? Um, there really is most recycling companies are losing money on grass, glass recycling, so there isn't really an incentive to to continue it. And what ends up happening in that in that case is that most of the glass that ends up in the recycling bin winds up being diverted to landfill, which is you know compounding the problem. 
um, you know, in terms of solutions, um, you know, we're not quite there yet, but little by little, it does seem that looking at extended uh, producer responsibility legislation, which is, you know, more and more coming on the docket, that that um, could be uh, a manner to effectuate change. Um, if there were more legislation in that realm, um, you know, it could potentially lead to a higher cost for a single use glass bottle, which would, you know, put that higher cost of the single use more in parity with the cost of reuse. <laughs> And excuse me, and more than likely um, uh, increase the motivation all around because sometimes you know the economics of reuse being a bit more expensive than single use can be a bar barrier to some that needs to be addressed. Um, so I think um, that sort of gives an overview of um, what I do with Good Goods and the State of the Union there. And I'm going to turn it over to Muriel and mute myself now because my dog is barking. Um, hello everyone. So my name is Muriel Chatel, and um, so I'm from Sustainable Wine Solution. I started at Borough Market in London um, over 15 years ago, and I got really interested in alternative format. Um, if I'm honest, I think at the time sustainability was probably not uh, my main motivation. I think my main motivation was economic um, and practicality. And in fact, because we were basically a wine shop at Borough Market selling wines from independent producers, the wines were high, more expensive than what you could find elsewhere in a maybe multiple retailer environment. And I thought, how can we basically, what is a hurdle? How can we basically raise the bar of the entry level wines? How can we make wines better? from lower on, and how can we make premium one accessible? And then in fact, if you look into it, it's packaging. If you remove packaging, then obviously more money is spent on, on the wine itself. And I think from my perspective, this is was my, my main motivation. So I managed to convince my producer at, um, to sell me wines in, in bag in box. At some point, we even had a Margo in bag in box. Um, I was the only one drinking it, but that's another problem. I mean, I don't think consumers were necessarily ready then. Uh, but then we went to the conclusion that if we could offer a white, red, a rosé that was going to trend on a regular basis um, in a refill bottle, so we would get the wines in bag in box. And then we had a, a dispense system. Um, of wine on tap and, and then people would come and refill, we would sell them the bottle once and then they would come and reuse the bottle. And that has been extremely um, successful. And it began, it became basically um, like the baguette in, in, in a bakery. And I think the French people would understand what I mean. It means that it's something that brings, uh, that creates footfalls, that creates conviviality, that makes it a good feel, a feel good factor that has been extremely important. And then on the back of that, we, uh, because we started supplying restaurants and we thought in a restaurant's environment, does it make, really, does it make sense to kind of like, deliver a bottle on a Monday for them to end up in the bin on a, on, on, on a Friday. Um, then there was the issue of corks. There was the issue of, um, I mean, there was many, many reasons that why it, it didn't make any sense. And again, I'm, I was talking about practicality. From a practical point of view, it didn't make any sense. The wine sold by the glass was not always in the quality it should be, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, we realized that bag in box, maybe in a restaurant environment, are not at that time anyway, were not easy to, to pour for a restaurant. And, and, and then we got really interested in um, a circular model. But that's being that's basically also about if you if you start having a circular model, then uh, you know, you reuse everything, costs go down, and then you get, then when you realize after, when you look into it, um, and that's when sustainability really came into it as far as I was concerned, um, all of a sudden it's, it's nonstop. And the only way, the only way to really approach the subject is to have an approach, a radical approach. I know it's not necessarily a word that people like to use, but I think with sustainability, it's only if you are radical that you can have an impact. And I think we need to be very clear about what we are trying to achieve because 
is it to feel good ourselves or is it to have impact? And I think if we have to want to have impact, we need to look at where are the solution? What is going to really make a difference? Um, and that's when we realize that the circular model, reusing cakes, reusing, reusing cakes um, was for us the, the, the way forward. And so we became in a way wine on tap specialist um, for the um, uh, on trade, so for restaurants and bars, events and stuff, it makes a lot of sense. But again, because we had a circular model, we were importing the wine in bulk and we were caking ourselves. But there was quite, I mean, for producer, it's a big thing to send the wine in bulk and let you keg it and let you, they were not, you know, so we had kind of a limited range. Um, and then we realized, we were approached by um, Damien Barton of uh, Langoa Barton, and he asked us if we could put together a bottle deposit scheme for him. And again, I thought the idea was fantastic, especially coming from someone from Bordeaux, which, I mean, I'm not going to say anything, but uh, they are not exactly always the leaders in, in terms of innovation and sustainability, but that has changed. And so I was so pleased, coming from Bordeaux myself as well, to see what was going on in the world of wine and uh, you know, to meet all those incredible people wanting to do things. But again, I said to Damien, I said, Damien, it doesn't make sense. If we are only going to bottle only your wines, then it makes you feel good. It makes me feel good, but that's about it. You know, um, if we want to make, to have an impact, we need to have a range and we need to standardize a bottle. You need to, uh, to, to let us bottle in a bottle that is going to be used by lots of different people, et cetera, et cetera. So that's when we started making the bottle part of the solution. And that's been incredible for us. I think it changed everything. It changed everything because all of, a, all of a sudden, we realized how much people are attached to the bottle and it would be a shame to, to see it disappear. And so also it meant that wine producers were a lot more into send us, sending us wine in bulk if it was going to be bottled. Uh, and we, we've got a winemaker in, in, in London now that's um, for quality control and stuff. But um, so all of a sudden we had this bottle that was part of the product, the, the solution. We were not just wine on tap specialists. We were sustainable wine, provider of sustainable wine solution. So the wines could be um, sold in bottle, 75 cl glass bottle or in 10 liters uh, keg, stainless steel keg that could be washed or in 20 liters stainless steel cakes that could be plugged in to a draft system in the restaurant environment. And I mean, what the conclusion I kind of like, I, I, I reached was that with sustainability, you need to choose what is your battle. You cannot be everything to everyone. And I think if we are trying to make things, to make solution, be the solution for everything, we, we, we are not going to succeed. For me, and, and that's because uh, I, wanted, um, I wanted a winning story, I wanted a high number of returns, uh, we decided to focus really on the on trade, so restaurants, bar, hotels. Why? Because it's easy to explain to them that we collect back the bottle. Basically, in one sentence, we said, you see, everything we deliver, we collect back. We deliver with zero secondary packaging, so no cardboard, no plastic, nothing. Um, we deliver kegs that can be reused. Again, no secondary packaging. And all of a sudden, it talks to people, because to, to the restauranters, because they're like, wow, that's crazy. I don't have cardboard to deal with. I don't have no noise pollution at the end of the night into throwing bottles in recycling bins. Um, then I've got wine on tap as a solution for wine served by the glass. So it's, it's kind of a no, no brainer if you want, but the key to that, what's very, very important is logistic, it's to be able to um, collect and deliver at the same time. And I think that's, that has been probably the hardest to put together because I think at first I thought, oh, it's easy. We are so used to whatever Amazon is doing. You know, you go and collect and everyone is going to do it. And it's, you know, but then you realize it's not actually because we could find someone to deliver and then, but they wouldn't collect at the same time. And I thought, well, no, we are not doing it. So we thought, okay, let's do it ourselves. 
And obviously, I mean, we are a small company. We can't start delivering every hour to everybody. And so we thought, well, where is the compromise? And the compromise is to get out of this Amazon model and to basically have fixed delivery server, fixed day of delivery. And so all of a sudden we, we went to our customers, we say, here is the deal. We can have this reverse logistic service at no extra cost, but you are going to get one delivery a week and it's going to be on a fixed day, which means that, well, you are going to need to get a bit organized or, I mean, and then again, you think that something that pushed you, so we were pushed into making those compromises, and then all of a sudden, everything is a lot more organized. There is a lot less stress everywhere because deliveries are organized, drivers don't get stressed, they know where they go, etc. Et and so that was um, something that was uh, great to be able to put together this reverse logistic service. However, Again, because it's it, what's great is when you, I mean, I'm, I find the, those type of projects so exciting because it never stops. Then all of a sudden you think, okay, what's the next stage? And the next stage you think, okay, I'm using a 550 grams bottle. When that, I, you know, it doesn't make sense. It's not nice for in the warehouse. It's not nice, it's heavy. Um, if people don't bring it back, it's a lot of waste. What could we do? So we thought, okay, let's try using a, a lightweight bottle. So now we are using a 390 gram bottle. And the thing is also I could do it because first it's my company. So if it doesn't work, uh, no one is going to blame me. Uh, I mean, I'm sure much uh, people would, but at the end of the day, I could make that decision and take that risk. And, but what we find is that because the logistics is so organized because restaurants know what they need to do because at the warehouse we know what we have to do we do not have any breakages and so we are using a lightweight bottle we do not have breakages or so little that they don't make it into the statistics um and yes yeah, so and i think that's impact and I think that's, you know, because in a way, the bottle, our bottle can be reused a minimum of 10 times per year. So that's, that's not nothing. Um, and I'm talking too much now, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I get, um, it, 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 it never stops this type of subject. But uh, yeah, the, my message is basically, it's possible to have a big impact and you need to be radical and you need to choose what is your battle. Um, and on that note, uh, Bernard, that's for you to tell us your story. You're muted. Bernard, on ne t'entend pas. It will be better like this, okay? So, so I'm very grateful for uh, uh, Porto Protocol and uh, especially Diana that take, took contact with me. And uh, I am very enthusiastic to, to see a dynamic uh, growing around uh, the interest of re reusing uh, bottles and to share and to try to change uh, things. So to present myself shortly, so my name is Bernard Graffé. Graffé Lecoq uh, is a family co uh, company I am managing uh, since 95. Uh, so, and in fact, uh, if we come back in the story, the way we are in Belgium, but we are working with uh, French wines. We source the wines in all the different regions. Uh, Bordeaux, Burgundy, Côte d'Or, and so on, and we bring the the the, the, the wine uh, bulk uh, in Namur in our cellars, uh, where we age the wine in the barrels, and then we bottle the wines. So, uh, regarding the uh, reusing of bottles, uh, since when? It's a long time ago. In fact, we uh, always have been in the family in a circular. Uh, model uh, since the beginning in 1879. So it's an heritage I have. So I had to 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 to, to confirm that uh, uh, I, 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 I was okay with this uh, way of doing about the scale of our activity. 
So we reuse each year between 400,000 to 500,000 uh, bottles a year so that uh, we wash and uh, we collect them back and uh, we wash and re reuse them. So about the, uh, how we package uh, the wines, it's uh, in uh, car car cardboard boxes, uh, but we get them back. Uh, you have to know that our market is uh, mainly local. I mean, Belgium, Belgium is a small country. So we are able with our trucks delivering to our private customers to take the bottles back once, uh, when we, we deliver the customers. We are fellow customers, so it's easy for us instead of coming back uh, empty in the small truck that we bring back the bottles, we sort them again and then we wash them again. So uh, about also, um, are we in this business model? Uh, we feel since lo a long time ago alone. Uh, I mean that uh, uh, for years, I felt like a retrograde Muppet, you know, uh, as uh, really nobody was uh, in 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 the, the in the customers uh, except the people that uh, were fellow with uh, our products that uh, were used to to bring back the bottles. But otherwise, on the market, the sensibility of the markets was almost zero. And I see something growing today, and uh, this this is something really interesting. I must say that uh, we are absolutely not helped but, uh, uh, by uh, legislation and uh, um, some taxes, incentives, and so on. There is a small difference between uh, a bottle going in the bin and the bottle we bring back. So this is really not something uh, today, uh, very, very helpful, but this is probably something that might be helpful in the future that authorities think about uh, uh, a way of helping people reusing uh, the, the bottles. This is, uh, I think, uh, a very important point. Um, so I think I said I will, I think uh, it's later I will talk about the, 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 the carbon footprint, but I would say today that our motivation for uh, reuse the bottles, uh, three points. The first point is that concerning the carbon footprint, the difference is huge. The second point is that the energy saving is not only helping the carbon footprint, but it's helping concerning the energy saving. And the third point is about saving some raw materials. So all these points together make sense to go further. I see some, some problems uh, that could be solved in the future. Maybe I'll, I will uh, explain more uh, deeply each point, but um, I think, uh, every um, action, every initiative that could come uh, with uh, uh, less uh, uh, sort of bottles and so that there is a, a standard so that people can share bottles together, it would be a good point. The second point is about the adhesive label. When you reuse a bottle, you have to wash it. It's a challenge. An adhesive label is really a nightmare. And really, uh, if you have it on a bottle, it's done. Uh, it's not possible. And uh, so all these topics uh, might be uh, points of focus for the future. I can uh, go more deep uh, on the topic uh, later, but uh, I would like to give the word now to uh, Lise with Awe to, to talk about, uh, about your experience. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Benar. And I'm so happy to be here. I'm very happy that OA is able to participate in something like this. So um, if you don't know the company, uh, we are the French committed wine brand. That's how we, we like to think of ourselves. And actually, it's how it was born. Um, compared to all of, uh, all of you guys, we are kind of new <laughs> in the business. We, we were born in 2016 when our co-founders, uh, Thomas and FX, who are not here today, met. Um, and they kind of ha they had this big realization that French farmlands are full with pesticides, especially vineyards, which represents 4% of our farmlands, but are 20% of all the pesticides we use. And um, they really wanted to, to kind of offer um, on the market a wine that was not filled with pesticides, so organic, um, was vegan also, because it's always better, and especially was committed towards the environment. Um, and that obviously goes through the bottle, which was a big point for us. And that's how we went into um, reusing our bottles. Um, however, we did not start right away because it was very hard to implement the system. So we started about two years ago uh, in May of 2020. Uh, and it was, it was a challenge <laughs> because there was nothing implemented in the first place. And our goal was to go national. So we wanted to be both national to work, to work with consumers, but also with professionals. So we kind of wanted to do everything and to have more impact, I guess. Um, and so at the beginning, we had to find uh, everything from the people to deliver, but also to pick up and to wash the bottles. And we had to find the right bottles that was going to be able to be used by everyone. And we had to find like even the labels, like as you mentioned, Bernard, um, like the, the glue, we had to change glues. We had to find a paper that was going to be washable everywhere in the country. We had to implement like having uh, little holes in it. Um, we also get got rid of the cap because the cap is only made out of plastic and, and is non-recyclable. And also like the corks and everything. So it was definitely like a big adventure. <laughs> Um, but we are so, so happy that we, we managed to implement it, at least on a smaller scale for now, but it's still a work in progress. We try and contact people every day to um, create um, a real national program and system for reuse reusable bottles. Um, as for the other commitments that OE is having and doing, because like, we reuse bottles, but also packaging. Uh, so we have, for big orders especially, we have a zero waste pallet that was extremely important to us. And we deliver our big cons uh, big clients and especially professionals with zero waste pallets that are um, also based on a refund system. So once they give it back to us, we pay them back. Um, and that was, yeah, that was very important. And uh, as for, um, I think the, the biggest setback for us was the fact that there is absolutely no standard nationally. And um, like everyone is doing things differently in France and one was kind of here to tell us which direction to take. So we, we, we kind of made everyone meet and say, okay, now we're going to use this bottle and that's going to be the reusable bottle. And we went on the 550 gram bottle just because we wanted it to be able to travel a lot uh, between like when we sell a bottle to, in, like, to a consumer in Paris, let's say, this bottle might then travel to Lille in the north of the country and then to go to Brittany and then travel everywhere. And a light bottle was not going to make the cut, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we really try and Im improve all the time about that. But mainly, yeah, reusing the bottles was mainly about saving energy also. 
because as all of you guys said, um, it's a miss, I think it's a miss like idea, I guess, that recycling is doesn't have any impact on the environment when it's recycled. So reusing is, I, we feel like the best option. So here is that for who is OE and <laughs> how we work. Thank you. Thank you, Lise. Thank you, all of you. Um, we had we had a little plan before we uh, before we started and um, through the story, a lot of the questions have been answered. So I just want to tell the other panelists, I think I'm just going to go freestyle at this stage. Um, so forget what we had planned. Um, uh, and I'd like to talk about, I think, more in depth, a few specific subjects. And I also want to uh, make sure everybody heard that it got repeated several times. Uh, what would be really great is if we all had one bottle. And actually, my my um, my birthday was last week. And as I blew out the candles, that's what I wish for. Why not? Um, because if say tomorrow, the whole world decided we share one bottle, the wine industry would dramatic and we we managed to implement the, the um, logistics of returning and washing. The wine industry would dramatically re reduce its impact on the environment and it'd be so simple. So anyway, that's that was my birthday wish. We'll see how it happens. I think um, at this stage, it would be great, Bernard, if you could talk to us about the, um, the analyses that you have done in, in terms of the life cycle of a washed bottle versus a new bottle, because I know you've really studied that question. We'd love to, we'd love to, love to hear more about that. Okay, thank you. Yes, indeed. For the 140th anniversary of the company, uh, I, I wanted to put figures on that. So we did ask an expert to calculate, uh, to compare uh, the carbon footprint of uh, uh, a bottle, a new bottle going uh, to the bin and uh, a bottle we, we bring back from uh, our customers and to compare the two processes. One situation is uh, really clear and explaining by itself uh, the situation. One, you have uh, uh, a bottle uh, recycled from the bin, you have uh, to to get the energy of uh, you have to get uh, 140 uh, degrees uh, Celsius uh, during uh, 24 hours. So you see the energy uh, you need to do that to wash a bottle. You do it during uh, our experiences 40 minutes with. Uh, temperature of the water of the water between 60 and 80 degrees so clearly there is a difference if you put figures on that so you have uh, about uh, for a recycled a new bottle it's 650 grams of uh, co2 per bottle and the process of washing a bottle it's 6 grams so you have a ratio on of 1 to 100. So it's clearly uh, at the advantage of washing. If you integrate all the external factors you can uh, get, of course, do you wash the bottle at the place you uh, bottle the wine or do you have to have a, a transport to collect and so on? So a lot of uh, hypotheses uh, can uh, play uh, but what, what I can say today is that uh, there is a ratio, um, and of course, um, because you can't use eternally a bottle, is not one at a time, uh, or experience is uh, between eight and ten times before you, you are close on the bottles, and at, at the moment, um, the presentation of the bottle is, is not good anymore. To put on the market so uh, this is uh, important so you have to put some new bottles in the systems uh, sometimes uh, if you put one uh, bottle for nine you uh, reuse bottles so it's changing of of course your carbon footprint so let's say that in the the we're working and uh, trying to reach now a ratio of one to six so it means that 
there is uh, still clearly a big, big uh, difference on this point. Does it answer the question? Yeah, that's great. And I think I should say um, that the washing logistics for, you know, are, there are two participants that are really doing, have been doing this for, for a long time. So Bernard and Muriel. Logistics are very different. Bernard is getting bottles from Belgium to Burgundy, actually, because they're in Burgundy, there is this company, Chevaux, that has been washing bottles since the 1950s. And they have a huge machine that can do, I can't remember, 1,500 bottles an hour or something and recycles the water recycles the chemicals and repalletizes and um, ships back to Belgium so I would like uh, perhaps Muriel if you could explain your bottle washer and uh, your reverse logistics and also could you tell us about uh, what you've done with your label to make it um, washable you're muted you're muted <laughs> You muted. <laughs> voilà. Sorry. Um, so the our labels basically it's it's not we are not completely there yet. There is still we think that we are on the third try. We've got we started with a biodegradable uh, label made with bagasse, which is a sugar cane byproduct. Um, and but then the bottle, which was great in terms of washing, but then it wasn't good in the fridge. Um, and you have to think about all those things, obviously. And now we've got um, recyclable uh, paper. Um, it's water, hydrosoluble um, label. And it's not as difficult to remove. So basically, you still need to soak the, to, to soak the, the bottles for about um, an hour. Um, and, and then it, it removes itself. Um, but I think what, what I mean, I mean, we find a solution for us, it works. We, um, the labels are as sustainable as they can be. Uh, but I think this is a, the big challenge for the, when we would have won is that when most label suppliers would, um, um, will be using labels that are easily um, reusable, easily removable. Uh, because you are talking about standardization, but it's true that um, it's key. So you could imagine a world where e everyone uses the same bottles and then every label is uh, easily um, removable. Um, and, and that's, but to go back to what we do. So basically we've got a washer, a, um, a small washer that is very efficient. I think there is a lot you can do on a small scale. And actually, I'm, maybe I should stop using small scale because people are going to think that it's too small. But in a way, I think I'm very interested in things that can be done um, in, a small and a, in a small and bigger scale because there is a lot that can be done. And so we find that by doing it in-house, the, the, the size we are, you can do a lot. I mean, it would take, um, you know, we worked out that um, um, the, the hub we do, we can wash, uh, at, at the moment, we can wash a thousand bottle a day if we want to, if we wanted to. And that's not necessarily yet. So I think we are not bottle washer. We are wine merchants that are doing most of their processes in-house, if, if it makes sense. Um, and our bottle washer, in, in a way, it's a, it's a Canadian machine that uh, each cycle is about three minutes and it's um, energy efficient. Um, you know. oh, that's, uh, thank you. No, that's really helpful. And I, I appreciate how strategic you are. I mean, Muriel is selling mainly, if I understand, mainly to restaurants and um, started. Or are you also selling direct to consumers? Um, no, I mean, we, supp we supply shops and during lockdown, we had to supply shops because restaurants were closed. But we want to, the, the fact that our bottle is lightweight means that it doesn't matter. If, I mean, no, it does matter if they don't bring it back. This is not what I mean. But if the bottle doesn't weight more than it would in our business model anyway, um, we are getting 80% return minimum with restaurants. And with consumers, it's about 50, it's kind of, I mean, we are, but we worked out it's about 50%, but with consumer, it can take six months for a bottle to get back to you. Uh, with a restaurant, it's one month, not even one month sometimes, two weeks, you know, so. 
Okay, we have uh, we have some questions now, and I think this one is is really important. Um, how long has it has it taken for consumers to accept bringing back bottles? And how? And so we'll start with Marielle, but I'd like to hear from everyone. And you guys just go ahead and pass it along to whomever you want. But how have you gotten consumers to participate, and to what extent have have consumers um, participated when you do sell direct? Okay, so the first thing, we've been supplying wine in a retail environment by the refill, in a refillable bottle for a long time, for over 15 years now. And we find that people have really went for it from, they loved it. They've completely embraced it. And we didn't allow people to bring any bottle. They had to buy it from us. I mean, not because we wanted to sell them necessarily a bottle, but we wanted to make it an object of desire. And we wanted to show that, um, you know, we wanted to control the, the product, the way the product was going to be drunk or presented on the table. And they, they loved the idea that they could help themselves, that there was a tap and it reminded them. And, and some bottles, some people came back with a bottle for, you know, I've seen bottles. Um, one shop we opened in 2011 with a one liter bottles. And we only used the one liter bottle for something like one month. So I know exactly when that was, and we still have people using it. And so that's, uh, you know, that's, uh, I don't think that could necessarily work in a supermarket environment, but in an independent wine shops, it can, it can work. People look after the bottles, they clean them, etc. But there are two things. There is wine refill, which in a way it's like fresh veg vegetable. You know, they serve the wine and within a few days they need to drink it. And then there is a bottle with a deposit scheme, which is kind of like a standard bottle of wine that basically you want consumer to bring back. The main challenge is how do you tell people that they need to bring it back? I mean, if they need to get their reading glasses before they understand that they need to bring it back, you are not going to see the bottle back. So on our bottle, and I think if people go on our Instagram, they could probably see it. Uh, we've got a, a, a white mark on, on, on the front of the bottle. And in a way, it's to, to say to people, OK, bring it back. Or in a, in a restaurant environment, you want the people to say, OK, that's a bottle that I need to put in the, in the crates to, to go back. So, but that's what something we worked out ourselves. We have, you know, and, the, and that can have impact. That can grow very quickly. But what the reason I didn't want, and we are doing it in house again. The only reason we are doing it in house is that I didn't want to commit to having fifty thousand or hundred thousand bottles with a white mark if people were not going to like it or if it was not good. So I think it would be good as an industry to kind of like agree on what that mark is going to be, uh, because it's. It, 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 um, I understand the wish for one thing, one bottle that can be used in every market, but we are kind of a farm. But already within um, merchant, if we could go a long way uh, to have a standard, like you showed me some bottles, Diana, uh, uh, you know, when we went to visit, which says bring me back or, or let's see what Verilia are doing, because it would be good to, to have a, a, a first a, a label. Yeah. So to answer the questions, uh, yeah, the refill, it's easy to get people to bring it back because it's kind of like wine they are going to, to drink within a few days and it makes them feel good because first they don't have any bottles to recycle and they don't see how much they drink. And so they, that's important. And, but um, uh, it's, it's um, then the bottle return in a consumer environment, it's, it's more complicated because um, it's more complicated because, you know, it, it would be good if every bottle were reusable because then you need, you know, you need to, well, because, but when you have to sort out what type of bottle you have, then that becomes, and I think convenience needs to be the first motivation. If, if we want to change behavior, we need to make sure that every solutions are convenient. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, so how about OA? How is OA getting consumers to participate, please? So uh, for us, uh, it's same as everyone. It was kind of a, a, a little challenge, but we strongly believe that education is the first way to make people bring the bottle back and explain all of the different things it does and how easy it is and, and remind also people that for many, many years people did it and only for the 
last couple of decades, we've been throwing away everything. But actually, when you always go back to the same store to do your groceries, it's not that much of an inconvenience to just take off all of your bottles or little uh, like Tupperwares with you and you can like buy everything in bulk and everything. And also, um, as you mentioned, um, Muriel, we have a little logo on our um, on our label that's oh, yes. French, um, like bring me back to be reused. And that says, OK, so the consumer consumer has it in has the bottle at home and he knows that this bottle can be reused because there is this logo. And that was something we really, really wanted to see and worked really hard to see. And it's very new still. Um, that's for the like national scale one. And for the lo locally, each of our partners have a different way of showing how this bottle is reusable. And I think it's at the same time, good because people feel like oh it's local and I know this person and I know this company and that's my like but reusing like my system kind of but it's also it can be a little bit of a stumbling block because what I think would make it easier for people if would would, would be if they knew that they could bring back the bottle anywhere and that's something that people have been telling us well okay, but if I give this bottle to my cousin and he lives halfway around the country, I don't know where, <laughs> he cannot bring it back. So where does he bring it back? And we're what we want to see is that everywhere in the country you can bring back your bottle and it will be reused the same way. So yeah, education and speaking numbers and reminding people they've been doing it before and it's not anything new it's kind of like recycling at first people were like oh my god like sorting out my trash gosh but after a while everyone was like it's not that hard so yeah making it easy education all of that okay thank you and i'd like to um hear because good goods has a different way of incentivizing i'd like to hear about that but um, <clears throat> there was a question that just came up quickly about whether the OA created the label or if it was international use label. I'll just answer. There's no international standard for reuse. No, no international standards, and we did everything from scratch. <laughs> Same with Muriel. She painted the bottles herself to show people this is a reusable bottle. So no, everybody has their own scheme for communicating to the customer that it's reusable. So Melissa, could you tell us about Good Goods? Uh, how you motivate cu uh, customers to bring back the bottle and also how you motivate your producers to use a reusable bottle, please. Sure, Diana. And actually things have shifted since we've, um, since we met and spoke, we are constantly evolving as is necessary in this space. So um, I'll, I will speak to what we did and why and what we're doing now and why. So originally we were selling the bottles to retail. Um, there's a three-tier system in the U.S. I'm the importer and distributor. I distribute, I sell to retail. The end consumer buys at the retailer. And then the expectation is that the consumer would return the bottle. Um, we originally tried to encourage or incentivize returns by um, issuing a credit to that consumer. So um, there is a unique bottle identifier on each of our reusable bottles. It is quite distinct though on the back label, but it's bright green and, and rather large. It's a strip label on the bottom. And the strip label includes a QR code, which can then be scanned when the bottle is returned by that retailer and a credit goes into the consumer's, the end consumer's account. So the original intent was let's basically pay them to return it because who knows if otherwise they, they would do it. Um, you know, unfortunately there was that level of cynicism Interestingly enough, it worked sort of. Um, I would say, you know, I was thinking about the statistics um, while everybody else was speaking. And I would say we were getting back roughly 2%, maybe 5% uh, peaks and troughs, uh, depending on the season. And certain shops were more successful than others. But we realized that okay, like this is a pretty uh, uh, large hill uh, that we're going to continue to need to, to, to climb and the money alone isn't gonna cut it. So that led to another layer of research, 
what in which stores are we seeing the highest level of returns and the highest level of success? Well, we found that it was in the stores where there was the largest range of selection. Um, you know, initially, um, only a segment of my portfolio was um, dedicated to allowed to be returned and and reused. Um, with this knowledge that the more stores have and the more choice consumers have in the store, the greater uh, likely they are to return. We expanded the number of selections within my portfolio to cater to that. We also noticed that when you create a section within a store, so sustainably packaged wines, reusable bottles, where it was more prominent and um, actually a conversation piece um, you know, between the um, you know, clerk in the shop and the consumer, that that also increased what we would call engagement in the end. And we saw increases in returns. So there were these little pieces to the puzzle that were helping us to um, ensure that that bottle that was sold in, in, in a reusable container actually came back so that it could be reused. That being said, the numbers were still not what you would expect at all. Um, not to mention, um, I love Muriel that you brought up um, the logistics piece and that tying that the forward and reverse logistics together was also a challenge that you had to overcome by doing it in-house. This was a similar issue that we were facing and something that we realized we had to tackle. So fast forward, present day, we are actually, we still have our reusable bottles available through the retail channels that we established over the past year. And in New York City, there are roughly, there are between 30 and 40 um, to date, I think it's like 36 um, that are, are actively participating. But we pushed pause on expanding our footprint of retailers that are accepting the returns. And we um, are now actually focusing on um, direct to consumer. Why? Because we have found that um, convenience, um, I forget who on the panel pointed out the convenience as being like paramount to everything. The convenience aspect of a return is actually, I think in the present moment, the thing that's going to actually help to shift the behavior all the education in the world may or may not actually motivate that consumer on a, a scale I think that's sufficient to have impact um, to actually return bottles on that scale. So with, direct, with a direct to consumer um, model, what's happening actually is the consumer that's buying that wine is having that wine delivered to them. And then when that wine is being delivered to them, that bottle can also be collected. So it's, a, it's essentially, um, a, a zero waste wine club where every bottle that that consumer is buying that's being delivered is also um, being collected. Uh, we like to refer to it as the milkman for wine essentially where that's happening um, you know, in total circularity. This is in its infancy right now. In order to uh, effectuate this at any level of scale and with any level of efficiency, um, we actually need to be doing the reverse logistics ourselves, um, which has been a major pivot. Um, and in order to uh, effectuate that in an effective way, we actually are starting to provide this um, tying forward and reverse, reverse logistics service to other reuse companies um, in the New York area that have had this similar challenge. It's amazing. Uh, companies have been super motivated to have their goods be in reusable packaging, but because the forward and the reverse logistics have been separate. And because it, first of all, it's inefficient from an environmental perspective, but also from a cost perspective. And because there hasn't been this service that ties it, um, it's really been an impediment to a number of these companies getting off the ground. So Good Goods is now going to be providing those logistics services, not only for wine, but for other goods. And there's a really interesting synergy too, because some of these other companies that may be um, delivering other, you know, uh, food goods or olive oil or whatever it might be are also interested in the wine. So it ties it all together. So now the incentive, Diana, to answer your question is convenience, because I think once it becomes something that's easier and not something that unfortunately, you know, inherently folks are somewhat lazy, I hate to say it, um, you know, unless it's actually like done for them, they may not be apt to make that shift. But I think once that shift is made, 
the education will have more meaning. Uh, oh, I, I'm doing it and I'm feeling good about it. it. Happens to be really easy for me to do it, but I can feel really good about it. And then I, I do think that there's the potential to spin it wider and have that actual behavior shift in the retail um, space, but we have to crawl before we walk. So that's been our recent pivot and we'll see. And that's big. Are you still doing consignment, even direct to consumer, or is there no consignment? It's just the service of picking up bottles. Just the service of picking up, which I think also in the long run is more economically sustainable. And as we all know, that's a huge piece to this puzzle, right? If we're endeavoring in this space, but it's not econom economically sustainable for us to do it, then you run out of runway at some point, right? And so um, you have to get creative. Okay. Um, so I must apologize to everyone. I was only looking at the chats and I didn't realize that there's also Q&A questions that I have um, been missing, but I think a lot of those questions have been answered over the course of our talk. And I just want to reassure everyone also that today's video is going to be posted live, uh, posted upon YouTube by tomorrow. It'll also be on the Porter Protocol website forever. And within the Porter Protocol website, there will be links on all of the subjects that we've addressed, which we will update as, as, um, as the, the movement to wash bottles evolves and it's, and it's snowballing right now. And it's really, really exciting. So we will update that with more information. There were questions about you know, getting into the nitty gritty of uh, carbon calculation of driving versus um, versus melting. And, and Bernard really did address that. It's, you know, it's, it's complicated. Um, carbon calculations are horrendously complicated, but no matter what, rewashing is definitely better than, um, than uh, recycling, which is, as we talked about, also kind of um, broken in some areas of the world. And, um, and so, yes, that, that has been proven, but we can get into those specific numbers. Also, we, can, we'll, we will get the information onto Porter Protocol um, so everyone can check in with it, uh, it as, as things evolve. Um, I guess at this stage, I just want to thank all of our participants. Uh, it's, you know, I saw, I, I think we heard, we heard the big underlying um, objectives and the work we have for ourselves in the form of legislation, in the form of education. Uh, there are businesses that are just waiting to be started uh, to help with the washing process. I mean, in order for this to actually work, we need more bottle washing companies. We need holding companies of empty bottles. All of those kind of, uh, those are opportunities um, that, that today's present day situation, which at times looks very, very dire, is actually um, a lot of opportunity. And I loved the term radical impact. I think that that is what we should all be ambitioning for. And that is what I heard in all of you today. And I just, I just, I want to thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, I get it. Uh, please keep stay posted on, on the developments on the Port of Protocol website. Please share with us. Um, your own case studies and join the Porter Protocol team and we will keep pushing on all of the fronts uh, that the wine business possibly can to have positive change and sustainability in the wine business. So thank you all. Uh, this has been a great start to my day and I wish you all the best for the rest of your day. Take care everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.